Hello, my friends, and welcome back. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Jared Halverson, and I look forward to spending some time in the Scriptures with you today. If these videos have helped you at all in your own personal Scripture study, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below, and I'll try to keep up with you on my end. Also, feel free to share, like, comment. I'll try to respond to those as best as I can. I've been meeting amazing people from all over the world, and I'm grateful for the chance to be able to talk about things that really matter with people that really matter. I hope today's discussion of King Benjamin's address, the second half, will be as powerful as our experience last week was. I'm grateful for the things that I learned and felt as I was studying, and I hope that today's continuation of his discourse will be a continuation of the experience that we had. Have you ever had a spiritual experience that was so powerful that you just didn't want it to end? Your mission, perhaps, that you just wanted to keep extending and extending and never have to come home? Maybe it was when you were a teenager and you went to EFY. I remember students of mine coming back after those experiences sometimes and saying, I, just, I never wanted to sin again. I didn't want the experience to be over. Sometimes it's a powerful endowment session where you just stay in the celestial room and you don't want to leave. Where your group has left and you're in there long enough that another group has come and gone. Those are powerful experiences in the house of the Lord. Maybe it was a fireside a devotional, a general conference, some experience that you just didn't, almost didn't want to move for fear of signaling to the Spirit that you were ready to end things when you really weren't. The first experience like that that I really remember was as a teenager at youth conference. And we had a fireside. I don't remember what was spoken about, but I remember the feeling I had at the end. And I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to move. I remember my best friend came up to talk to me right afterwards, and I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want to goof around. I didn't want to laugh. I just wanted to kind of freeze in that moment. After five months of studying abroad in Israel, I'd, I felt like I'd seen everything that I wanted to see in the Holy Land, but I wasn't done feeling what I felt there. I just wanted to stay and savor it longer. It's a lot like that third Nephi 17 experience where Jesus has been with the Nephites from chapter 11 all the way through 16 and tells them it's time to go. And they look at him as if they would ask him to tarry a little bit longer, as if they would. They couldn't even bring themselves to ask, but they just wanted the experience to continue. President Harold B. Lee provided an experience like that. Well, better said, the Lord provided an experience like that through President Harold B. Lee for a group of about 300 college-age young adults from across the country. These were institute leaders and Latter-day Saint Student Association leaders from all over the place, and they had come together to receive some training from the prophet. Now, I spend my life with college students, and if there's a group that's more energetic, more social, more fun-loving than they are, I don't know. Well, teenagers could probably give them a run for their money. But imagine 300 young college-age Latter-day Saints together. They were going to have a fireside with President Lee, and then they were going to have a dance. You can guess which one they were probably more excited about. And yet, at the end of President Lee's message, nobody wanted to leave. There was such a powerful experience there that they just sat there in silence and no one moved. Finally, they began escorting President Lee off the stand and he was walking down the aisle in the chapel and halfway down, the congregation just began singing, The Spirit of God Like a Fire is Burning. He left, and eventually they trickled out and went back to their dorm rooms. Nobody wanted to dance, so they had to cancel it. Can you imagine canceling a dance for 300 college students? All because they were having a spiritual experience that they did not want to come to an end. That's what's happening to King Benjamin's people. Based on what we talked about last week, with all of this preparation in chapter 1 and 2, the discourse that he gave them in 2 and 3. By the time chapter 4 begins, they've had a life-changing experience and they don't want it to end. And so King Benjamin continues. It's almost like they've had one session of general conference and now they're ready for the next session. And the prophet speaks again. When I was younger, I always just pictured one long discourse and that's all it was. But it's interrupted by the experience that the people have and that they describe at the beginning of chapter 4. And then King Benjamin continues. And what he says in these chapters, particularly in chapter 4 and 5, is how to hold on to the experience that they've just had. 
The word retain comes up several times in these chapters. What happened in chapter 2 and 3 is they obtained the remission of their sins. And in chapter 4 and 5, they are taught to retain that remission by doing certain things. And that's what we want to talk about today. Let's start in chapter 4, verse 1, 2, and 3, where we left off at the end of last week. After having had this incredible experience with him, King Benjamin looks around having concluded that first portion of his discourse, and sees that the people have fallen to the earth. Now, remember last week we talked about the three things that he was hoping would happen for his people? That they would feel true humility, recognize the distance between themselves and the Lord, that their desires for righteousness would increase, and thirdly, that they would begin to exercise real saving faith in Jesus Christ. In verse 2, all of those things are happening. At the beginning, they have viewed themselves in their own carnal state, less than the dust of the earth. There's their humility. Halfway down, they plead for forgiveness of their sins and that their hearts may be purified. Those are those righteous desires welling up within them. And third, they express their belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Faith has begun to flourish within them. And as a result of that, notice what they ask for right in the middle. Oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ. They recognized that the only hope they had to bridge the gap between themselves and the Lord was through the atoning blood of Christ. And so they pled for it. Notice, by the way, the words that are used here. I spend my life in Scripture, and so I've become more and more sensitive over the years to the kind of vocabulary that the prophets use and that the Lord speaks in. I call it the grammar of God. And often, the words that we use to describe scriptural principles are not the words that the scriptures themselves use. And I think sometimes we lose something in our paraphrases. For example, when we talk about going to the temple for the first time, we say that we take out our endowments. I hate that verb. To take it out, like it's some kind of library book that we're checking out. The endowment is a gift from God. Therefore, the endowment is something that we receive. That's a far better verb. Or if you really want to get scriptural, we don't even say that we receive the endowment. We simply say that we are endowed with power from on high. Another vocabulary word that I've become sensitive to is the way that we describe the atonement and what we're supposed to do with it. What's the verb on our side for the atonement? I often hear the word use, that we use the atonement. But again, that, the connotation of that just seems to suggest that it's, oh, it's some tool that we keep in the toolbox, but occasionally we bring it out when a job is needed and we use the atonement. Even worse, in my opinion, is we sometimes say, take advantage of the atonement. That we need to take advantage of the atonement. There's a lot of baggage with that phrase as well, to take advantage of something. So what's the better verb? I love the one that is used in chapter 4, verse 2, where they say, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ. To apply. Now, apply can be used in two very different ways. One is, if somebody has something, they can apply it to something else. We talk about applying bandages to a wound or applying ointment to a cut. And that's what the Lord is doing. The Lord is applying the atonement to every potential situation. Meanwhile, what are we doing? That's the second form of apply. We apply for jobs. We apply for college. We apply for scholarships. We ask for something that we cannot obtain on our own. Something that we may or may not deserve, but that someone else has to decide if they're going to give it to us. Both of the forms of that word are present there in verse 2. Because they are applying for the atonement. They're pleading for it. Have mercy, they pray, and apply the atoning blood of Christ. We are seeking something that we cannot obtain on our own. But if we will apply for the atonement, then Jesus can apply to our every need his atoning grace. Too often we think of the atonement. In fact, President Nelson described it this way. We sometimes think of the atonement as an object when really it's a person. It's Jesus we sometimes imagine in our minds some kind of bank vault, some Fort Knox of sorts, 
where you turn the big wheel and you pull back the heavy door and there's some mountain of gold bullion that's used to pay our debt to justice. Not quite. That's something that we use. That's something we take advantage of. But really, if you want to stick with that mental image of the bank vault, fine. But when you pull open that heavy door, it's not a pile of gold bricks. It's a throne. And sitting upon it is the Savior. He is the atonement. He's the atoning one. And we apply to him in hopes that he will apply to us the blessings of his enabling grace. That's exactly what these saints are doing in verse 2. In verse 3, after they had spoken these words, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. It was that quick. It's amazing how long it takes for our earthly applications to be reviewed. Here, it doesn't have to go to underwriting. You don't have to get it stamped and signed and notarized. It goes to Jesus and the Spirit of the Lord came upon them just that quickly. And as a result, they were filled with joy, having received, past tense already, having received a remission of their sins, just like they asked for, and having peace of conscience because of the exceeding faith which they had in Jesus Christ, who should come. Again, doesn't that sound like Enos's experience? Lord, how is it done? How is my guilt swept away? It's because of your faith in Christ. Here, how is it possible that I can be filled with joy and have such peace of conscience? It's because of the exceeding faith which you have in Jesus. Notice the order, by the way. I think sometimes we wait, we we hold back a little bit. I don't really want to commit fully to the Lord. I don't want to exercise faith in Him until He's proven Himself. Until I am filled with joy and have peace of conscience. The problem with that, waiting on faith until those conditions are met, is that then our faith is at the mercy of those conditions. When faith is meant to alter our conditions, or at least our attitude towards them. Because of their faith, that came first, right? Faith precedes the miracle. We receive no witness until after the trial of our faith. That because of their faith, the joy comes. The remission comes. The peace comes. And it comes in the same order for us. Verse 4, then King Benjamin opens his mouth and begins to speak unto them again. He recognizes the experience is far from over. In fact, it cannot end here. So he says to them in verse 4, My friends and my brethren, my kindred and my people. What a way to address this audience. I love his order. Before he calls them my people, which is probably what you'd expect a king to say to his subjects, he refers to them first and foremost as friends and brethren. That sounds a lot like Joseph Smith to me, honestly. In the Doctrine and Covenants, he concludes a letter that he sends to the saints with basically his signature, your humble and never deviating friend. I love that. Joseph was a man who valued friendship so much and considered those friends his brethren and kindred, not just his people. Here King Benjamin again calls their attention. He had their attention before, now he calls it back. This is like the experience he had with the angel when the angel said, awake, and he awoke. And the angel says, awake, again. And so King Benjamin again calls their attention. I'm still not trifling with words. I still need your ears and your heart and your mind, just like you gave me for this first half of the message. Stay with me here, he tells them. And what he tells them is how to hold on to the kind of life-changing experience that they've just enjoyed. Verse 5. For behold, if the knowledge of the goodness of God at this time has awakened you to a sense of your nothingness and your worthless and fallen state. Notice what he said woke them up to that sense of nothingness and fallenness. The goodness of God. Remember last week when we mentioned Jonathan Edwards? That famous 18th century revival sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That sermon was so full of hellfire and damnation that it seemed like the brimstone was going to fall any second. In fact, Edward said it was about to. He described his hearers as spiders that God was dangling over the pit of hell. And the only reason he hadn't dropped them in yet is he hadn't thought about it. But oh, he was starting to think about it. 
People literally fainted and fell in the aisles, shrieking. The first time he gave the sermon, he couldn't finish it because people were passing out in tears, agony, all because of this sense of nothingness brought on by an angry God. And yet King Benjamin is describing a good one, a loving father, a patient and condescending Christ. If that's what you've come to see him as, then not only do you know that you must come unto him, but more importantly, you know that you can, that he's welcoming, that he wants you to return to him. It's the goodness of God that awakens us to that. We don't have to be scared into submission by thoughts of some angry deity. We can be loved into lowliness through this image of the goodness of God. That is a profound difference. Either way, we're supposed to be feeling this humility, right? It's that humility that recognizes the distance between us and God. But ask Einstein about distance and he'll say, it's all relative. Am I far away from you or are you far away from me? In this theological version of the theory of relativity, am I far away from God because I've fallen so far? Or am I far away from God because he's risen so high in my estimation? In other words, is it the depth of the pit that I'm in or the height of the pedestal that God is on that makes me recognize how much I need him to close that gap? Notice, for example, how King Benjamin raises that pedestal in verse 6. I say unto you, if ye have come to a knowledge of the goodness of God, again, picking up where he left off, and his matchless power, and his wisdom, and his patience, and his long suffering towards the children of men. Do you see how Benjamin is describing Jesus? Power is the only one that even hints at that just side of him, which is just as important as his merciful. But the focus is on his patience, his long-suffering, his infinite goodness towards us. Those are the attributes that underwrite the atonement which has been prepared from the foundation of the world. Let me see if I can paint this picture with an analogy and with an experience. When I was 16, we went on a family vacation to central Utah. We came up from L.A., my cousins came down from Salt Lake, and we were going to meet somewhere in the middle to go camping for a week or so. Now, I just got my driver's license, and so I wanted to stay behind the wheel at all times and get all the practice that I could. And amazingly, my parents let me. I have teenage drivers now, and I'm not sure if I'm quite as brave as they were. But here was the problem. I didn't know the area at all. And so I had to follow my uncle who was driving the lead car. Now, his car was far better than mine was. I was driving the old van that I think the mechanics probably drove more often than we did. And secondly, as a new driver, I was kind of nervous going too fast. And my uncle had a a heavier foot than I did. Everything seemed stacked against me as far as keeping up with the leader here. So we're going through the middle of nowhere in central Utah around corners and up over hills. And anytime there was an incline, the distance between me and my uncle would increase. I would just pray that by the time I got to the top of the hill and could start speeding up again, I could still see him in the distance and hope to catch up. But I was scared that whole trip, knowing that if I lost sight of him, this is the days before cell phones, I would never be able to find my way. My only hope was keeping up and never getting separated. Does that feel like a description of discipleship sometimes? That the only thing we know or the only thing that we're taught is obey, obey, obey. As if that was on ledger one that we talked about last time in order for us to earn our salvation somehow. But think about keeping up with Jesus. Now that we do have cell phones, I've asked my students this before. If you were in a caravan and you were trying to keep up with the lead vehicle, and could only remember one number about that vehicle, would you prefer the license plate number or the cell phone number of its driver? If all you know is the license plate number, then you can recognize that car, but it better stay in sight at all times. But what happens if you get separated? Even if it's not your fault. I'm not saying that you you purposely veered away and took some other path. 
It can be something as simple as a red light that you hit and they didn't. Or somebody pulling out in front of you because you were trying to give some leading distance. And with a passage of time, perhaps through no fault of your own, I can't see the lead driver anymore. And I don't know how to find them. If, on the other hand, I chose to memorize their cell phone number, then whenever there is separation, I can call them, ask them where they are, explain what happened, seek help to be able to return. I'm not saying that we don't teach our children obedience. That's how we reconcile our will. That's the second ledger. That's the practice to be able to learn, not earn, but learn the life of righteousness. But if we have taught our children to connect, they know the cell phone number, they know how to connect with heaven, then whatever separation comes into their lives, through their fault or not, they'll know how to come back. Yes, we teach obedience, but we have to teach repentance and forgiveness even more. The difference between these two approaches became very clear to me after a conversation I had with a student. She had made some mistakes some big mistakes, bigger than mistakes she'd ever made in the past, to the point that she really thought it was over for her. Now, this was a good kid. She always had been. But as a result of that, she only knew how to follow the lead driver. She only knew license plate. She never thought she'd need a cell phone. I'm never going to have a, di a distance that I can't overcome. Until then. And now she thought, honestly, that all was lost. What do I do now? I'm no longer worthy. I've lost that, and it can never be regained. But had she been more familiar with the goodness of God, his patience, his long-suffering, the atonement we had he had prepared from the foundation of the world, then of course she'd know that there's a way home, even for her. It reminds me of a conversation I had with another young person who was struggling over some mistakes or a sense of inadequacy bigger than she'd ever dealt with before. And at one point, I kind of jolted her into consciousness by asking this question. When are you going to start loving Jesus? Now that jolted her because she does love Jesus. She knew it and she knew that I knew it too. And so she immediately protested. I do love Jesus. You know that I do. And I said, you're right. I do know that you do. But how do you love him? What role of his do you love? So far, I think you've spent your life loving Jesus as your example, your teacher, your guide. Because you have done so well at following that example, learning from those teachings, staying close behind that guide. Until recently. And now what? It's one thing to love Jesus as your example and your guide. It's another thing to love him as your Savior and Redeemer. And that's what I'm asking. When are you going to start loving him like that? When are you going to admit that you need saving? And that's what he came for. I'm serving right now with an amazing bishop who pointed out an incredible truth to me as we were talking about conducting temple recommends. He pointed out that in the second question that we ask, it's the one about having a testimony of the atonement of Christ. We ask them at the end, do you have a testimony of his role as Savior and Redeemer? There is no shortage of titles that could have been used in that question. To be welcomed into his house. We don't ask people if they have perfectly followed him as a teacher. We ask them if they have faith in him as their Savior and Redeemer. Can you admit you need saving? That you need to be redeemed? And that it only comes through him? In fact... In the recent changes that have been made to the Temple Recommend interview, question two has my favorite change. It used to be, do you have faith in and a testimony of the atonement of Jesus Christ and of his role as Savior and Redeemer? The new version asks, if you have a testimony of the atonement of Christ and of his role as your Savior and Redeemer. It adds that one beautiful possessive pronoun. It's not enough to just think, yes, he saves and redeems everyone else, but I know myself too well. I've gone too far. No. Do you believe him that he is yours? 
that he came to save and redeem you because you are in need of saving. It's the goodness of God that allows us to be vulnerable to the point of admitting that we need that goodness. In fact, that reminds me of the sequel of the story that I shared about this young woman who felt that it was just everlastingly too late for her because she couldn't keep up with the lead vehicle. She continued making changes. We had some amazing conversations, and more importantly, she and her bishop had some amazing conversations. And she began to change. She began to repent. And her perspective on the Savior as a Savior began to deepen. She realized that she'd only seen one side of him and hadn't allowed this other side to come to the fore. And she began loving him and being grateful for him in ways that she hadn't before. And then she asked a question that was interesting to me because she realized that her love for the Lord had increased based on her sin and repentance more than based on her lifetime of diligent obedience and hard work. And can you sense the danger there? I got this sense from her that there was almost a, we should sin so that we can appreciate the Lord's atonement more. This is something that Paul worried about. He said, should sin increase that grace should abound? God forbid. And as I was hearing this from this student and kind of sensing where she was going with it, I felt those God forbid kind of signals as well. But it did make me think. Our love for Jesus does seem to increase as we recognize the increase in distance. But the question is, are we, do we need to dig a deeper pit when we're already in one? Or can we simply elevate the pedestal to where it belongs? From King Benjamin's perspective, it was recognizing God's goodness that woke them up to a recognition of their own nothingness and fallenness. Even without major sins, that he's, I don't see it. He doesn't chew them out the way Jacob does back in Jacob chapter 2. This seems to be a, a well-behaved congregation. They came to the temple. They wanted to learn. But they still had some change of heart needed. They needed to come to know Christ. In fact, maybe they needed to know it better than anybody because their pit wasn't very deep. And the way King Benjamin helped them recognize their need for this Savior and Redeemer was not to dig the pit. It was to elevate the pedestal. You see, this young woman felt that if he forgives me more, then I will love him more. And while logically that makes sense, that's not quite how it works. In fact, go back with me to Luke chapter 7. This is, I think, the best place to understand this principle clearly. This is the story of Jesus with Simon the Pharisee and this woman that has been a sinner. In fact, the whole city knew that she was a sinner. In older versions of the King James LDS edition, there's even a typo. It's my favorite typo in all of Scripture. This is Luke chapter 7, verse 39 when she's described as a sinner. But the typo, there's three ends in sinner in the old version. They've corrected that sense. I'm kind of sad about that. Most of us sin only sufficiently to become a two-end sinner. She was a full-fledged three-end sinner in her. And Simon knew it, and he was shocked that it seemed like Jesus didn't know it himself. Remember the story? She comes in weeping, washes Christ's feet with her tears, wipes them with the hair of her head, and then anoints them with this precious ointment. And Simon is horrified by this. If Jesus had known how many ends were in her sin, he would have kicked her with those feet, not let her wash them. But Jesus, perceiving this on the part of his host, gives a little parable. Verse 41, there were two debtors. One owed 500 pence and the other 50. But the creditor frankly forgave them both. And then Jesus asks, Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Notice the order the forgive, in the parable. The forgiveness comes whose love will increase as a result. That seemed to be the experience that this young woman was having. And true enough, Simon says in verse 43, Well, I suppose the one that got the most forgiven. The bigger the debt, the bigger the credit, the bigger the gratitude. Jesus says, 
right enough. But then in 44 and 45 and 46, he compares all that this woman has done for him compared to the little that Simon did for him. And then Jesus says this in verse 47. This is the passage that's key. Wherefore I say unto thee, interesting, he's speaking to Simon, but about her. He says it loud enough that she can hear it too, but this message is for Simon as much as for this woman. I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, only one end in many, but there could have been room for more. Her sins are many, are forgiven. His justice came in saying her sins are many. His forgiveness came, his mercy came in saying they are forgiven. This is a lot like the woman taken in adultery. Neither do I condemn thee. There's the mercy. Go and sin no more. There's the justice. Both justice and mercy are on full display here in verse 47. But notice what Jesus then said. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Notice the order. He didn't say, her sins are forgiven, and therefore she loved much. He said, her sins are forgiven, for she loved much. In her case, it was her love that preceded her repentance. In fact, it didn't just precede, it probably precipitated it was her love of Jesus, her understanding of his goodness, his approachability, his mercy, his patience, his long-suffering, all of those things that King Benjamin describes. It was that that gave her the courage to be vulnerable, to be able to come forth into the home of a judgmental Pharisee, no less, but to come because she loved much. And because of that love, Forgiveness came from a Lord who loved her too. He then turns directly to her. I don't want you just to overhear this as if it was a conversation between me and Simon. He turns to her and says, thy sins are forgiven. And concludes the conversation by saying, thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Faith preceding that miracle. Love preceding that gift. Not the other way around. That is what Mosiah chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 seem to be teaching us. Recognize God's goodness. Be filled with love and faith and humility and gratitude in advance. And come to him. Recognize your nothingness, your worthless and fallen state. And come. You know you must, but you know you can. Who's he describing at the end of verse 6? Those who put their trust in the Lord, those who are diligent in keeping his commandments, and those who continue in faith unto the end of their lives. Do you see the same three goals that King Benjamin set at the beginning? To develop their humility, their righteous desires, and their faith in Christ? It's right there. Humility places trust in the Lord instead of in the arm of flesh and all the diligent obedience that we can grit our teeth and muster. Diligence in keeping the commandments? Talk about a righteous desire that is welling up within them. And faith? He says the word right there to continue in that. We even see the two ledgers hinted at in those phrases. Putting our trust in God is all about ledger one. Creation, preservation, salvation, it's promised me. It's a free gift I simply need to receive. Diligence in keeping the commandments, that's ledger number two. So that I can reconcile my will to his. And third, faith, continuing in faith to the rest of my life, that's letting God do the accounting. And not worrying about where the debits and the credits will go. Simply coming unto Christ and receiving the salvation that he offers. Verse 7, this is the man or woman who receives salvation. Who receives it. Who recognizes that they can't go and grab it. They can't hold on tight enough to be able to earn it. They receive it as the gift that it is. Through the atonement which was prepared from the foundation of the world for all mankind, whichever were since the fall of Adam, or who are, whoever shall be, even unto the end of the world. 
If that doesn't describe the plan, well, I don't know what does. That the atonement was in place from the very beginning. From the foundation of the world. So it would cover everybody from the fall on to the end of the world. The rest of the Christian world that sees the fall as this tragic mistake, what does that do to their depiction of God? That he was blindsided? He's up there pacing heaven going, what was I thinking putting that tree down? I didn't even make it one generation before they ruined the whole thing. The fall of Adam and Eve did not send God back to the drawing board. That was the plan from the beginning. In fact, we usually think of the pillars of eternity, as Elder McConkie called them, creation, fall, atonement. We usually put it in that order because of chronology or history. That there was a creation, those seven days until it was very good. There was a fall, Adam and Eve being expelled from Eden. And then fast forward, and at the meridian of times, there was an atonement through Jesus Christ. So, chronology, creation, fall, atonement. However, if the atonement was prepared from the foundation of the world, Peter describes this in his epistle, saying that Jesus was the lamb without blemish. That's sacrificial, right? Here's atonement language. The lamb without blemish prepared from before the foundation of the world. Which means that logically, the atonement preceded creation and fall. Didn't come in the aftermath. Yes, it, it happened after But logically speaking, the key part of the plan is atonement. The key part is Jesus. Remember the Father's question? It wasn't, what shall we do? It was, whom shall I send? This whole plan revolves around atonement. You cannot become like me without atoning grace. That's why King Benjamin said earlier that even little children, even if they could sin, which they can't, they still wouldn't be the kinds of children of God that they need to be without the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the sanctifying aspect, far beyond the justifying aspect that little children don't need. So to make that point in premortality, whom shall I send? Who will be the central figure? that will teach and enable every other child of God to become someone like him in order to become someone like the Father. Ironically, we don't seem to know we need the atonement until we've come face to face with our fallenness. Again, this is why King Benjamin is describing things the way he does. So it's almost as if the Father was saying, okay, atonement first and foremost. People need to be able to tap into Christ's enabling grace. How will we wake them up to know that they need that? Well, I guess there'll have to be a fall. And I suppose there needs to be a place where that can occur. So I guess there's going to need to be a creation. Chronologically, creation, fall, atonement. Logically, theologically, atonement, fall, creation. Paul teaches this to the Romans, that the law wakes us up to our fallenness because we can't keep it perfectly. That's second ledger anyway. And so we turn in faith to Christ for the salvation that can only come through him. I talked before about pits and pedestals. Well, on the one hand, like I said, we don't have to dig a deeper pit. We're all in one by nature. That natural man that is an enemy to God and always has been and always will be until Christ comes and lowers the rope. Now, this part usually makes sense to us. Of course, I'm in a pit. I can't climb my way out. And so thanks to the atonement of Christ, he will lift me. But once we get to the top and talk to him, he'll start to explain to us what that rope was intended for all along. It's as if he would say, you know, I use this rope a lot to rescue people from pits. But more than anything, I'm a mountain climber. And this is the gear that I use to ascend the highest heights. Now that you've felt its strength, now that you can trust the rope and trust me on the other end of it, having pulled you out of this pit, are you ready to go climb with me? Now that you understand the reality of justification, are you ready to continue on to sanctification? That's what I've really wanted to do all along out of your pit to help raise you to my pedestal. Come and climb. 
One last thought here before we go on to the next verse. There was an early Christian father, an incredible theologian. His name was Gregory of Nyssa. He was uh, one of the Cappadocian fathers at the end of the 4th century AD. What he's most known for is a doctrine that he came up with called perpetual progress. The first time I heard that, that phrase perked my ears up as I thought about eternal progression. I was in divinity school. I was one of two PhD students that were in a class that was meant for master's students. It was covering the whole swath of Christian history from the time of Jesus until the Reformation. And the professor, who was this incredible Jesuit priest turned university professor, said to me and my fellow PhD student, you two have to do a lot more work than the rest of them. You're working on a higher degree. So I want the two of you to come meet with me about once every two weeks. And the three of us will really dig into some things that we're not going to cover in class. Well, one of those conversations ended up being about Gregory of Nyssa and the parallels between his doctrine of perpetual progress and Joseph Smith's doctrine of eternal progression. You see, what Gregory was grappling with was this question that was on his mind of how do you balance the permanence of salvation with the agency of human beings? In other words, Gregory thought, I assume that salvation is permanent, but if we have the power to choose, if we maintain our agency, then isn't there always a danger that we'll fall from our salvation? If, on the other hand, salvation is permanent, then does God somehow remove our agency from us? Do we become puppets at that point, having, having proven that we learned how to use our agency in life, and now it can be taken from us? These are the things that kept people awake in the fourth century, I suppose. But it is a fascinating thought. Choice on our part, agency, does leave open the possibility of poor decisions, of falling from grace. So is salvation permanent or not? It doesn't seem that both of them can be permanent, agency and salvation. Something's got to give. Unless, and this was Gregory's big breakthrough, unless we're able to continually move forward, then we're choosing, but we're also progressing so that we're not falling. My children teach me this every time that we go to an escalator. Because whenever they see an escalator that's coming down at the bottom, they want to run up. You catch the analogy? The escalator coming down, that's the danger of our own agency. We always have the ability to fall because of it. But if I choose to continually run forward, then it doesn't take me down. And so as Gregory described, God will always be superior to us. We'll never catch up. But if we can continue to progress to become more and more like him, this is language from DNC 93, right? If we can go from grace to grace and receive grace for grace until we receive a fullness, the Father and the Son are always ahead of us. But I can grow and progress and therefore keep choosing but never slide backwards. It's a profound insight. And the restored doctrine of eternal progression answers a question we didn't even know that anybody ever had. That was a fun conversation between a Jesuit professor and a Latter-day Saint student. And in a way, that's King Benjamin. The goodness of God, the distance, the gap, recognizing my nothingness, my fallenness, but not just in a matter of pits, it's for pedestals, and I just want to keep climbing. I know that I can through his help. Verse 8 then, This is the means whereby salvation cometh, and there is none other salvation save that which has been spoken of. This is it. This is the answer. This is the goal. We sometimes say that all roads lead to Rome, and while I don't agree with that, there really does seem to be only one road. This is the salvation that we're after. And there's none other. It's why Jesus says to his apostles in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is the salvation that's being offered. There isn't any other. In Moses chapter 6, right before the end, Adam, who has fallen, has also been taught about redemption. 
which will require faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, enduring to the end. And then at the end of that beautiful chapter, Moses chapter 6, the Lord then says, This is the plan of salvation unto all men through the blood of mine only begotten. This is it. This is the plan. It will work for everyone. I sometimes hear people who have left the church or are thinking about leaving say, "Ah, you know, the gospel just doesn't work for me. Well, there may be things about church culture that are difficult. I'll admit that. But the idea that God's plan doesn't work for someone is simply untrue. With things like temple work and the spirit world and the millennium, every loose string can be tied with a tidy bow. There's not a single child of God that is outside the redeeming reach of Jesus Christ and his restored church. This is the plan, and it works for everyone. In fact, it was designed with that specific goal in mind. If the plan isn't as all-encompassing as the love of God, then it can't be his. And so this one really will work for everyone. But notice what else he says in verse 8. It's not just that this is the only salvation that's being offered. Neither are there any conditions whereby man can be saved, except the conditions which I have told you. So it's not just this is the only goal. These are the only conditions whereby we can arrive there. So again, back to that saying, all roads lead to Rome. There's only one Rome, but there's only one road One condition, one set of conditions that gets us there. There may be many roads that get us to the road to Rome. I will say that. I'm grateful for God's goodness and kindness and generosity in allowing for so many different pathways to the path in this life or the next. But the path, which is Jesus, those are the conditions to salvation. And there aren't any other conditions And there isn't any other salvation. It reminds me of a verse in 1 Nephi, chapter 13. This is at the end of uh, the visions that Nephi is having. And here he sees the Bible and the Book of Mormon coming together to teach truth, to restore plain and precious parts. And at the end of chapter 13, verse 40 and 41, it says this, that these two books together teach that all men must come unto him, Christ, or they cannot be saved. So this is, again, the only path, the only road to that salvation. But notice verse 41. I think too often we stop with that thought of, yeah, it has to be Jesus. If you can't, don't come into him, you can't be saved. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and so on. But notice 41. And they must come according to the words which shall be established by the mouth of the Lamb. Ooh, there's conditions then. It's not just that you come unto Christ. You have to come according to the words of Christ that he has established. I sometimes worry when I hear people say, fine, I'll come to Jesus, but I want to come on my terms. That does not sound like an unconditional surrender. We have conditions. We want to do it our way. But if it's his salvation he's offering, which is free, as Lehi says to Jacob. Again, ledger number one. Maybe, actually, now that I think of it, maybe that's why we try so hard to combine the ledgers. There might be some of us that think, kind of scared, I have to earn my way. But there's that other side of, hmm, if I can get God in my debt, then perhaps he'll have to let me do things my way. Is it the conditions of salvation that we want to change? No. We come to Christ on his terms, not on our own. We do it his way because he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what unconditional surrender looks like. By the way, and this might be hard to hear for some of us, the verse continues in 1 Nephi 13, 41, that they must come according to the words which shall be established by the mouth of the Lamb, and the words of the Lamb shall be made known in the records of thy seed as well as in the records of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The words of Christ, his conditions, will come through prophets and apostles. Ancient scripture, modern revelation, whether by mine own voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. And those are the conditions. And there aren't others. Again, I am so grateful for the 
flexibility of God. He will allow us to wander around the mountain so many times and will teach us and love us and beckon us all the time. But eventually our path must merge with the path, his path, and we need to walk it his way. That's how we come home. Now that may lead to some difficulty because there are times where the path doesn't seem very clear or perhaps not even very inviting. There are times that we're wondering exactly where the guide may be going. We get a sense of that at the end of verse 9 when it talks about man not comprehending all the things which the Lord can comprehend. There are times I just don't get it. But remember what the Lord says through Isaiah. My ways are not thy ways. My thoughts are not thy thoughts. Now he could have left it at that. And that's a gentle way of saying we just see differently. We're going to have to agree to disagree on this one. But the verse continues, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So he starts with, well, they're different. And then he admits, okay, mine are better actually. It's not just that we don't see eye to eye. It's that you don't see clearly because of your lack of elevation. My ways aren't just different. They're better. So please trust me. Please develop the humility and the faith for your righteous desires to become in in line with the desires that I would have you have. Now, this can be difficult when we don't understand what God is doing. And yet, verse 9 is full of faith. That is, it's full of the word believe. And he asks us to believe four different times in verse 9, and then two more times in verse 10. And the things he asks us to believe in are what makes it possible for us to accept God's will, even when we don't completely understand it. In my classes, I would often try to carve out time for one class that was just Q&A. Students, ask anything you want. We'll talk about it. And I was amazed at how often questions would turn towards eternal families and exactly what they're going to look like in the next life. Sometimes it had to do with same-gender attraction. Sometimes it had to do with being single for your entire life. Sometimes it was a matter of divorce or death, widows and widowers, remarriage in the temple, those kinds of things. Anytime that somebody's life or family didn't seem to make the cover of the ensign, it didn't seem to fit the Latter-day Saint normal mold, there were these questions, what's it going to look like for me? And sadly, we don't know all the answers to that. It kind of is a believe that man doth not comprehend all the things which the Lord can comprehend. In fact, in conversations with some of my evangelical friends, when they push back against eternal families, I'll sometimes say, hey, I'll admit, your heaven is a lot simpler and more straightforward than mine. The numbers match really well. It's like one harp and one cloud per angel. The numbers work. Just go with it. Our heaven is way more complicated than that. It's it's messy, you could even say. Why? Because earth life is messy. Families are messy. There's not kind of one size fits all. So how's God going to sort all that out? Well, I don't comprehend all the things the Lord can comprehend. Now that lack of an answer sometimes seems unsatisfying. So what do I do? What can I do to kind of hold on to it? King Benjamin gives us the answer with his other beliefs. That is, you can believe that you don't comprehend everything that God does and be okay with it, if you believe these other things that precede that realization. He says in verse 9, believe in God, first and foremost. Believe in Him. Believe that He is. Secondly, that He created all things both in heaven and in earth. Believe that He has all wisdom and all power both in heaven and earth. And if you do, then believing, or or perhaps better said, admitting that we don't comprehend everything that He does is, is an okay admission. I always tell my students, in the absence of knowing for sure clearly how it's going to look or what it's, how it's going to work out, there are four things that you do need to know about God. Number one, you need to know that he's there. Because if he isn't, then we're wasting our time thinking about eternal families anyway, because there's not eternal anything. Number two, if God is there, do you know that he knows all things? Is he omniscient? Because if he is then that won't be a difficult question for him. We may be scratching our heads here in mortality. He isn't. He gets it. Thirdly, you have to know that God is omnipotent. It'd be a real bummer if there was a God that didn't know the answer. 
He's just up there going, hmm, good question. You stumped me. It'd be just as bad if there was a God who knew the answer, but didn't have the power to actually make it come to pass. He couldn't implement it. It's like, oh, I got the best idea. Oh, I can't do that. But there is a God who's omniscient and omnipotent. And fourth, and perhaps most importantly, do you know that God is love? If you want to stick with the omnis, not only is he omniscient and omnipotent, he's omnibenevolent. He's all loving to go along with all powerful and all knowing. And it's that love that will make sure that his plan, which is right because he knows everything and which he'll do because he can, because he's all powerful, will be the best possible outcome for everyone concerned. I don't know how things are going to look in the next life as far as details for my gay brothers and sisters for stepchildren and parents that were sealed and then annulled or resealed to someone else. I don't know. But those four things I do know. And what does King Benjamin tell us? Believe in God. Believe that he is. That's that first all-important beginning. Believe that he has all wisdom. There's his omniscience. And all power. There's his omnipotence. And the previous few verses, his goodness, his wisdom, patience, his long-suffering, his atonement, his all-lovingness. I can trust him. I'm willing to. He deserves at least that much from me. And then, verse 10, with that trust, believe that I must repent of my sins and forsake them and humble myself before God and ask in sincerity of heart that he would forgive me. And if I believe these things, I've got to do them. I love how King Benjamin ends verse 10. This is like faith without works is dead from James. If you believe these things, then act like it. Live this way. By the way, verse 9 and 10 are also an incredible illustration of what was taught in the lectures on faith. Those three keys to exercise saving faith, according to the lectures. Number one, you have to know that God exists. Believe in God. Believe that he is. Secondly, you have to have a correct understanding of his attributes and character and perfections. Believe his wisdom, his power, his justice, his mercy, his patience, his long-suffering. Know that he's there, but know what he's like. And then third, and this is often hardest for us, know that you are living in such a way that you can call upon God's power and wisdom to meet your needs. That's when faith becomes powerful. When you know that you can call upon God and you're living in such a way that you're able to receive what he's offering. That's verse 10. Believing in our repentance, our forsaken sins, our humbled heart, our sincere desire. Are we living that way? Then it's so much more easy to exercise faith. 